Well, I've been told that these pictures were taken in Missouri last week. I do hope I've been misinformed. Because if I'm not misinformed, we've got guaranteed spread here. But whether they're in Missouri last week or not doesn't matter too much. It just shows that we can't do this sort of thing for the next months and possibly for the next year. We have to have this new normal. And this is illustrated by this Australian group, Ag Unity, who are putting these posters up around the world in different languages. Now, this one is in Bali in Indonesia. But it, uh, you don't need to speak the language to see what it's saying and to see these droplets in the air. So an excellent poster there. And this one, again, in Bali in Indonesia, is showing the... Uh, the idea of the R naught, the spread, how quickly the disease will spread, depending on the number of people that are an average person infects. Now, I'm hoping to have some more from them uh, later. They have some excellent uh, infographics. I'm hoping to bring you some more on that. Welcome. Glad, glad you've come back. Um, now, this week I'm looking at some therapeutics, some drugs that we use to try and treat COVID-19. Now, I know this isn't for everyone, so I'm going to give you the bottom line now. T today's talk is on hydroxychloroquine. And the bottom line is the World Health Organization have just taken hydroxychloroquine out of their trials because of uh, fears of toxicity effects that the drug could actually be doing harm. So they've suspended their trials on hydroxychloroquine until they are more satisfied about the safety profile. Now, of course, people have been taking chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine for years for malaria and for autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, the doctors that are prescribing that have got the doses quite well worked out. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about the use of hydroxychloroquine in COVID disease. And the bottom line is that so far there's no evidence of efficacy and uh, it seems to be doing harm to patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19. The outcomes seem to be worse. Uh, more people dying, uh, as we'll see in these studies today. So um, it's just such a pity that this drug has become politicised. What we have to do is look at the data, look at the science. <clears throat> so far, it seems to be saying that people with COVID-19 disease are worse off if they take hydroxychloroquine especially if it's with an antibiotic as we'll see now i know what people are going to say they're going to say that these trials don't involve zinc and that's true they don't but this is the data we've got now you can speculate all you want about other treatments and there might be good rationales for them and it may they may even work but we don't know so basically we've walked into a dark room and we have a spotlight and we can shine lights on things and the data is the only thing that shines the lights for us. We, we need the data. So we can only talk about what we know. So that's the bottom line. It's disappointing because hydroxychloroquine is cheap and readily available. And uh, it, it'd, be a, it'd be a pity if it doesn't work. Now, we don't know if it's effective in prophylaxis. There's no evidence for it being effective in prophylaxis in preventative measures. And uh, there's no randomised clinical control trials on using it with zinc that I'm aware of. So um, all I'm going to do is, is tell you the data that we have and a little bit about the story and how this came about. So if you want to, uh, you want to skip this one, I've given you the bottom line. If you want the details, then, of course, they, they are interesting and, and applicable because I think this story tells us more things more it gives us more information than just about hydroxychloroquine because it shows that we need proper trial data on which to base clinical decisions because it's imperative that that uh, in healthcare we do no harm and we can only do this based on sound data and we can't it's dangerous to rush things. I know, I know there's such a thing as compassionate prescribing and individual doctors can make individual decisions. Um, but we need we need data. So that, that's what we're looking at now. Now, this story probably arguably began a while back. I don't want that one. 
on that one. <clears throat> this was low dose hydroxychloroquine reduces fatality of, crit in, of critically ill patients with COVID-19. So this was an early study from China that people got really excited about at the time. I can remember it and um, look, look it up for yourself. It's, it's, it's readily available. All these notes and um, links are published, of course, um, that it seems to be helping. And this was now this is on this is on a uh, PubMed, so you can download it. I think it's from China Life Sciences. So it's a bit difficult to tell from these Chinese publications, but it was published on the fifteenth of March. So it seemed to be showing that patients that were critically ill were benefiting from hydroxychloroquine in a study in China, and it looks like this paper is now discredited, or not so much discredited as contradicted by later work. So I'm not going to spend much time on it. So this original Chinese paper does hydroxychloroquine reduce death of uh, the, the, the reduce the death risk of critically ill COVID nineteen patients is the question. It was a retrospective study, which means it's looking back at work that had already been done. Ideally, trials should look forward to work that is about to be done. It studied five hundred and fifty critically ill patients with COVID nineteen in Wuhan from February the first to April the fourth. So so far so good. 550 patients received uh, comparable basic treatments, including antiviral drugs and antibiotics. So they were com so all basically what they're saying is all the all the patients had comparable treatments. It's just that some had they were given the hydroxychloroquine. Now, uh, 48 of them actually were treated with oral hydroxychloroquine for uh, seven to ten days. So not a large number. 48 is not a large number, really. And primary endpoint is fatality of patients and inflammatory cytokine levels. In other words, what they wanted to see was, was giving the hydroxychloroquine reducing deaths and reducing the amount of inflammatory cytokines. Now, these inflammatory cytokines, cytokines are chemicals that are released by cells and carry messages to other cells. And there's inflammatory cytokines that mediate the process of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is one of the problems causing the severe acute respiratory syndrome. So we want to, we don't want excessive inflammation. So high, high inflammatory cytokine levels would indicate excessive inflammation, which would indicate the disease process is more severe. So we don't want that. And they compared between hydroxychloroquine and non-hydroxychloroquine groups. So, so far, so good with the Chinese study. Now, what this early, this early Chinese study showed was that 18.8% of people in the group that received hydroxychloroquine died compared to 47% dying in the group that did not receive hydroxychloroquine. And the difference between these two numbers, the difference between that percentage and that percentage, was highly significant. This means there's only a 1 in 1,000 chance that the result could arise by chance. And they also found that the inflammatory cytokines were significantly reduced, indicating there would be less inflammation in the bodies of the people that took the hydroxychloroquine. But there was no change to the inflammatory mediators in the group that did not receive hydroxychloroquine, the non-hydroxychloroquine group. So they concluded hydroxychloroquine is effective in reducing deaths by reducing cytokine storm, this inflammatory storm that can kill people. So they thought it should be prescribed. So that, that's where, that, that's where that, this sort of started off. So that's the first Chinese study <clears throat> looking promising. But then last week I published, uh, I didn't publish the study, of course. <laughs> I took it from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I, I, I talked about this last week. And uh, the conclusions were hydroxychloroquine administration was not associated with uh, either a greatly lowered or an increased risk of intubation or death. So this study was indicating it's not stopping people going on ventilators and it's not stopping people dying. Uh, this said findings do not support the use of hydroxychloroquine at present outside randomised controlled trials, which the World Health Organisation is doing, but of course has just suspended. Um, so that they wanted to limit it to that. And clinical guidance at our medical centre has been updated to remove the suggestion that patients with COVID-19 be treated with hydroxychloroquine. So this was taken out of their um, out, out of their current range of drugs that were being used. So full, full details on that in last week's uh, video on hydroxychloroquine. So this is starting to cast doubt on it. So it started off looking good from the Chinese data. 
But this is clearly in contradiction to the Chinese data. So was the Chinese study uh, fundamentally flawed in some way? I don't know, but it's starting to look like it, isn't it? So this new study now that I want to dwell on, hydroxychloroquine with or without a macrolide. Now a macrolide is a type of antibiotic for the treatment of COVID-19 in a multinational registry analysis. So this is, this is big, big time stuff. Now the macrolide as an antibiotic, so uh, azith azithromycin or clarithromycin. So these macrolide antibiotics, they're not penicillin types. And you can always tell them because they end in mycin. So that's what uh, they thought that we're giving. The original one that I used to use a lot is erythromycin, but um, clarithromycin is more commonly used now. Anyway, they're, they're the two they used, azithromycin or clarithromycin. That was their macrolide. So in other words, they thought that if you give the hydroxychloroquine with one of these antibiotics, you get a good effect. Now, uh, <clears throat> hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are generally safe when used for approved indications such as autoimmune disease or malaria. And as we mentioned, we use it commonly in this country for rheumatoid arthritis. So the, uh, the safety and benefit of these treatment regimes is poorly evaluated in COVID-19. So this drug is effective in some forms of malaria, although of course a lot of malaria is now resistant to chloroquine. And it's also beneficial in autoimmune disease and rheumatoid arthritis. This is known. But we don't know whether it works and whether it's safe in COVID-19. It's a different situation. Now, this is promising. Hydroxychloroquine has been shown to have in vitro activity against the SARS coronavirus 2. Severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus type 2, which is causing the current COVID-19 pandemic. In vitro, of course, as we looked at yesterday, means in glass it means in the laboratory environment. So it sounds promising, doesn't it? But does it work in real life? And we looked at examples of yesterday where things worked in real life. Sorry, where things worked on the bench in vitro, but did not work in real life in vivo. So the fact that it works in the lab doesn't mean say it's going to work in practice. Recently published human trials, along with other unpublished data, suggest that it could be, it could decrease the duration of viral shedding and uh, symptoms are given early. So people have been talking about this. Does it actually work in, in humans? Now, what this study did, and this is impressive, there were 671 hospitals in everywhere but Antarctica. <laughs> so basically the whole world was roped into this included patients hospitalised between 20th of December 1919 and the 14th of April. So this is one heck of a big study. All these patients had a, a positive laboratory finding of SARS coronavirus 2. They had the antigen. And they accumulated a group of nearly 15,000 patients. All these patients were treated within 48 hours of diagnosis. So the study we looked at Last week, the patients were often treated when they'd been ill for some time. So was it the fact that the hydroxychloroquine had been given too late? Well, this accounted for that. Patients treated within 48 hours of diagnosis. So all the patients treated with hydroxychloroquine in this group of nearly 15,000, the number, the N was nearly 15,000. They all had it within 48 hours of diagnosis. So this is hydro hydroxychloroquine used at an early stage of hospitalization. Now, it gets even cleverer. They had four groups. Um, group one was given uh, chloroquine alone. 1,868 patients given chloroquine alone, just chloroquine. Second group, chloroquine with a macrolide antibiotic. That number was given in that group. Third group, hydroxychloroquine alone. And uh, fourth group, hydroxychloroquine with a macrolide antibiotic. And again, we see all the numbers here are substantial. Now, from these numbers, we get good data. You can do spectacular inferential statistics on numbers of this magnitude. And as well as that, to control these against as a control group, there was 81,000 patients who didn't receive 
any of these treatments. So that number had chloroquine alone, that number had chloroquine with a macrolide, that number had hydroxychloroquine alone, that number had hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, with, a, hydroxychloroquine with a macrolide, and that group had none of those. They just had supportive treatment. So you can see we've got an excellent comparative sample here. This is a high quality, <coughs> very, uh, very large number piece of research. Now, some patients were excluded they weren't allowed to enter the study. Patients in whom treatment uh, was started more than 48 hours after diagnosis. So all these people, the treatment was started early. Patients on mechanical ventilation who already had advanced disease were excluded. And patients who'd received the antiviral drug remdesivir were excluded. So what did they find? So they accumulated 96,000 patients with COVID-19 hospitalized during the study period and met the inclusion criteria. This is good numbers. This is very, very good. And they controlled for multiple confounding variables. Now we know that older people are more likely to get severe disease. We know that women are less likely to get severe disease. Men are more likely to get severe disease. We know this disease has affected some ethnicities more than others, particularly those with darker colored skins, like African Americans and Asians in the UK from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. We know that body mass index could well be a risk. There's debate about that, but it looks like obese people are more at risk. Although that one's less clear cut. But they accounted for it anyway. Underlying cardiovascular disease and its risk factors we know are a risk. Diabetes we know is a risk. Underlying lung disease we know is a risk. Current smoking, immunosuppression. All these things we know are a risk. So the study, cleverly using advanced statistical techniques, accounted for all of these. So this is impressive stuff. What did they find? Now... The in-hospital mortality in the control group was 9.3%. Uh, so 9 point, just, just ignore that one for now. Ignore that comment for now. So 9.3% um, of patients um, in the control group died in hospital. The group that received hydroxychloroquine alone, 18% died, nearly double. The group that received hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide antibiotic, nearly 24% died, way more died, well more than double. The group that received chloroquine alone, 16.4% died. And the group that received chloroquine with a macrolide antibiotic, 22% died. So this explains, I believe, why the World Health Organization have suspended these trials. This is quite profound data. So remember, this is hospitalized patients diagnosed with COVID-19. Definitive PCR diagnosis. The ones that didn't receive hydroxychloroquine, 9.3% died. The ones that did, 18% died. The one that received hydroxychloroquine with the antibiotic, 23.8% died. Those that received only chloroquine, 16.4% died. Chloroquine with a macrolide, 22% died. So um, if you were admitted to hospital, which group would you want to be in? Well, I would want to be in the group who had the lowest risk of dying. And that would be a group that did not receive hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without an antibiotic. To tell you the truth, I'm convinced. Now, this is de novo ventricular arrhythmias. Now, um, what this means is um, you probably know that the heart is in two, two, there's two lots of chambers in the heart. So there's the, um, <clears throat> there's the top chambers, the atria, and there's the bottom chambers, the ventricles. And it's the ventricles that pump the blood out into the body, into the lungs. And these large ventricles surrounded by this muscular myocardium pump the blood out. That's why, you're, that's why I'm a, a conscious now. That's why I have a blood pressure. My heart's pumping away like that. And we need ve good ventricular function for that. That's called sinus rhythm. Now, a ventricular arrhythmia is when there is a alteration in the rhythm of the ventricles. So the ventricles are no longer contracting properly. So the ventricles can, can contract in an improper way. One is ventricular tachycardia. 
which would be like that, or, or another is ventricular fibrillation, which is like that. That's a cardiac arrest. So, so the ventricles need to be pumping properly to get the blood out. So if the ventricles aren't pumping properly and there's no history of that, that is a de novo ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, a, a literally means without. Dysrhythmia is a better term, but we won't go into that now. In other words, the heart started beating abnormally. Let's leave it as simple as that. Now, in the control group, 0.3% of heart started beating abnormally. In the hydroxychloroquine group, 6.1% of hearts started beating abnormally. Hydroxychloroquine with a macrolide, 8.1. Chloroquine alone, 4.3. Chloroquine with a macrolide, 6.5. All way higher than the 0.3 in the control group. So if I said to you, pick one of these probabilities that you will go into a, a de novo uh, ventricular arrhythmia, that your heart will start beating abnormally. Well, personally, I'd pick the lowest one. I'd go for that one because that gives me the least chance of developing this ventricular abnormal heart rhythm. And of course, that's the control group that received none of these. What does this mean? The study was unable to confirm a benefit of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine alone or with a macrolide antibiotic. Each of these drug regimes, so the chloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine, with or without the macrolide antibiotic, decreased in hospital survival. In other words, you're more likely to die in hospital and the probability of that being a fluke finding is one chance in 10,000. The P equals 0.0001. This is good statistics. This is about as good as it gets in statistics, medical statistics anyway. They also found out that uh, the drug regimes with chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, with or without a macrolide increased frequency of ventricular arrhythmias when used for the treatment of COVID-19. So when used for the treatment of COVID-19. I'm... Um, um, this is completely convincing data. Um, now, <clears throat> independent. Oh, this is a few other things they found out. Uh, independent predictors of in hospital mortality. So again, increasing age, increasing body mass index. Uh, more people that were black or Hispanic died. People with coronary artery disease, that was a risk. Congestive heart failure, that was a risk. History of abnormal heart rhythm, that was a risk. Diabetes, high blood pressure, high levels of lipids and fats in the blood, abnormals of cholesterol, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, current smoke and immunosuppressed. So again, now we know all these things already, but this is nice to have this confirmed by such a large scale study. So this is saying these are known comorbidities and they are independent predictors of people dying. So all of these things are risk factors for more severe disease and deaths as we knew, but this is now nicely confirmed by this large scale study. So, <clears throat> so um, association, associations with reduced in hospital mortality, oh, this sounds better. So people less likely to die were female. In other words, men are more likely to die, women are less likely to die. Now this says Asian origin. Now this gets confusing because when we say Asian in the UK, we normally mean Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi. Um, and we know they're more likely to die. So when this study talks about Asian, it's more talking about um, East Asia. So Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, um, people from Eastern a Asia, less likely to die. Interesting. So what we're saying is that African Americans and uh, people from the Asian subcontinent are more likely to die, but compared to to, to white people, but uh, people from East Asia are less likely to die. I would like to know why that is. I really would. I can see I can see the vitamin D hypothesis for the darker coloured skin. The vit vitamin D hypothesis, sorry, vitamin D. But why people from East Asia should die less? Interesting to see if this is going to be confirmed. Now, there is some preliminary data that does suggest this is true. Interesting. 
If we could find out why, wouldn't it be nice to equal everyone down to their lower levels of uh, mortality? Uh, now, uh, ACE inhibitors in this study uh, re reduced uh, reduced the risk of in-hospital mortality. Now, this is angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors that are used for blood pressure. Uh, there's another sort of uh, drug used for blood pressure, the angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, that didn't seem to reduce uh, mortality, but ACE inhibitors did. Not going to dwell on that now. It's a bit of a finer point. And also people on statins, um, these drugs to lower cholesterol, died less. So this is why I believe the World Health Organization has just cancelled their trials with hydroxychloroquine because this large-scale data shows that people that are admitted to hospital with COVID-19 disease who started hydroxychloroquine treatment in the last 48 hours are more likely to die, regardless of whether it's chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, with or without the macrolide antibiotic. They're more likely to die. That's what the data shows. And uh, I believe that this little bit now of the coronavirus story has been lit up by a, a torch, by a flashlight. We, we can now see that bit and uh, we need to incorporate this information. Now, this doesn't say anything about prophylaxis. I know that. But I know of no evidence that taking chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine reduces the uh, risk of contracting COVID-19 in the first place. And of course, uh, this study, this large international study, was not given with or without zinc. So what does that tell us about taking zinc with uh, hydroxychloroquine? The answer is, I believe it tells us absolutely nothing. We need a study on that. But given that the World Health Organization have stopped uh, the trials with hydroxychloroquine because of this increased risk until they establish the safety profiles, I'm not quite sure what they intend to do about that. But that is the data as it stands. So um, unfortunately, the, the therapeutics we've looked at so far are not promising and uh, do no good or are actually harmful. The one we need to look at next, of course, is uh, remdesivir, which is slightly more encouraging. But it's not, it's not a magic cure, it's just... Uh, anyway, that, that, that's for another video. <laughs> Thank, thanks for watching.